Thank you very much, Alicia, for the most gracious introduction. Thank you. And Bob, I'm honored to be your friend, too. It's a great honor. So good afternoon. I appreciate the invitation, Mario and Kathleen, to speak at the National Day of Glass. It's an honor and a great pleasure to do so. My brief talk will be on indispensability of glass for sustainable development. Now, we already have had many excellent talks today that link loss to sustainability. So of course, I'm not going to spend 20 minutes repeating all those things. What I'll do instead is focus on some high value, total high value, I should say. Almost everyday material containing glass which we take for granted. And yet, without that, we cannot handle the challenges we are facing in the climate sector. And I'll also, being a technical person, try to bring in some data as well, if time permits. What's happening here? Okay. So we'll begin with some introductory remarks, deep background on the indispensability of glass for modern living, ubiquity of glass. And then I will quickly go into the indispensability of glass for sustainable development. And I'll focus in two areas, energy savings, and renewable energy generation. Now we have heard, as I said earlier, many great talks in which we covered the healthcare, the energy storage, and of course the communication. So I'm not going to repeat those things. Also time permitting, you know, nothing can be indispensable if the cost of making it is larger than the benefit we are getting from that. So if time permits, I talk about the efforts glass manufacturers have made to reduce the environmental footprints of glass manufacturing. And of course, we'll end with some concluding remarks. Because generation, transmission, and use of energy is inherently coupled with climate. So when we talk about the role of glass in energy sector, inevitably we are talking about the role of glass or the impact of glass on the climate. I don't think the audience here needs any reminder from me that glass is ubiquitous. We are talking about arts, architecture, transportation, communication, healthcare, we depend on glass either by itself or as a part of a larger system. I will highly recommend this article to people who may not have come across it yet. It's by Douglas Main, which was published in 2018 titled The Most Wonderful Material, or The Most Important Material. And here's a quote from there. Without glass, the world would be unrecognizable. So the word sustain means, as we all know, is linked to indurability. Durability. Something must endure. The two words are coupled. So for anything, any system to be sustainable, for sustainable development, that development has to be durable for people, for planet, 
But of course, it has to make economic sense. There are many ways people have defined sustainability. The United Nations and its 2030 agenda for sustainable development defined it as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And in 2015, you have seen this slide a few times already, 2015 they came up with 17 sustainability development goals. And the proposal that was submitted by Alicia to the UN General Assembly, that proposal established the glass and glass affiliated organizations are playing indispensable role in 11 of the 17 development goals. That was a pretty convincing proposal to the UN. All right. So I mentioned before there are many ways in which glass is critical for sustainability. And in my brief period here, I talk about energy savings and renewable energy generation. You already have heard several references to energy storage, healthcare, information, architecture, and infrastructure. So let's begin with some data. Here is the total energy consumption in the US in 2020. That's the left hand pie. That was about 93 quadrillion BTUs. I could not get the data for the 2020 greenhouse gas emissions. But 2019 was about 6.5 or 6.6 billion metric ton carbon dioxide equivalent. Those are massive numbers. The left pie chart showed you the distribution of that energy. And you can see that about 40% of that 93 quad is used in residential and commercial buildings. Again, huge numbers. And one third of that is consumed in heating and cooling of buildings. Yeah? So that means in 2020, almost 13 billion, uh, sorry, 13 quad BTU was used for heating and cooling. Think about it, massive numbers. So you can already begin to see that we can insulate the buildings, we can get some massive payoff in energy. And the two sectors, commercial and residential, they account for about 13% of the GHG emissions. Or in numbers, the total direct emissions in the US was 852 million metric ton CDE, carbon dioxide equivalent, related to the buildings. And if you add indirect transmission, indirect is associated with the emission that took place in generating that energy, that's as another 1150. Yeah. Massive numbers. Here I have listed some of the common building insulation materials. That's the first column. The right column gives you the thermal conductivity values of those materials. And the fiberglass and the stone wool. Most glass companies which make fiberglass insulation are also in the stone wool business. They are the largest insulation materials in the building sector, about 40%. And this is what is eye-catching. So if you use insulation, fiberglass or mineral wood, the energy that you save in first year alone is 12 times the energy it took to manufacture it. So that makes it indispensable. 
Yeah? If you figure that the building lasts for, I don't know, 25, 30 years, you can see that in the, it's a gift that keeps on giving. You recovered all the energy that was made in about an order of magnitude of that in first year alone. In the 2020 global market for insulation was for both fiberglass and mineral wool was almost 28 billion US dollars. <clears throat> All right, another very common thing that we come across without thinking about are the windows. See what happened here. Okay. The windows account for 25 to 30 percent of heat loss or gain through the buildings. And the smart windows, which manipulate the transmission characteristics of light through thermochromic, electrochromic, or photochromic effects, suspended particles, have the potential to cut that down by 30 to 50 percent. So again, a very common material, not common material, but common product that plays an extremely important role in sustainability. <clears throat> Another way in which glass saves massive amount of energy is through glass fiber in the glass fiber reinforced components. And here in the table, you can see some lightweight material if they can be used in the chassis of the automobile, the potential for weight reduction. A 10% reduction in vehicle weight ends up saving 6 to 8% of fuel. And glass fiber composites can reduce the weight by 25 to 35%. Again, big numbers. Of course, it is also used in other applications besides automotive, in aerospace, in marine, in high speed planes. So now we'll come to the role of glass in renewable energy generation. And we again begin with some data from 2020. So remember the total energy usage was about 93 quad in 2020. And the distribution of the source where that energy came from is in the pipe. <coughs> so the renewable energy represented 12% of that. That is not a massive number, but that 12% is much bigger than it was about 10 years ago. <coughs> And for the first time, I think in 2019 itself it happened, that renewable energy was larger than the coal. It has been here too. And out of that 12%, 37% come from wind and solar. And glass plays an extremely important role in both those sectors. So here are some data. Between the 2010 and 2020, the cost for the onshore wind generation has gone down by 56%. That's why it overtook coal. It's not someone trying to kill coal industry, <coughs> the economic factor. The global installed capacity went up from 178 to 699 gigawatts. And the glass fiber reinforced plastic in the wind turbine represents the largest fracture, largest component in the composite market, about 55%. 
and the business is expected to grow to about 19 billion by 2026. So that is the panel for the wind. Now we come to the photovoltaic. <clears throat> the cost reduction there in the same time frame, 2010 to 2020, is even more dramatic, 85%. And the global installed capacity has gone up from 42 to 714 gigawatts. And the global solar market was 52.5 billion in 2018. I found that number hard to believe, but you know, it's 2026, it is expected to grow to 223 billion. <clears throat> now, as I said earlier on in the second slide, I think that the benefit that we are deriving has to greatly outweigh the cost. So we already showed you the fiberglass insulation, mineral insulation. The energy that you save is many, many, many orders of magnitude larger than the energy that was consumed in making it. I haven't had the time to do similar calculations for composites, but I'll do that in future. But in addition to maximizing these benefits, we had to make the footprints smaller and smaller and smaller. So I can say that over the last 10, 15 years, the energy intensity, that the amount of energy that it takes to make a ton of glass has come down dramatically. When I joined Warren's Corning after my work at MIT, the amount of energy that was used to make a ton of glass was about 12 to 13, 14 million BTUs. By the time I retired, it was down to about 3.8 or so. So it happened over very many evolutionary steps. It wasn't that someone had a dream and you wake up. It was through a lot of attention to details over a long period of time that happened, a factor of three. So obviously as the energy intensity has gone down, the environmental intensity, the climate intensity of making glass has also gone down. As have the other environmental emissions. The amount of water that is used has gone down. The production efficiency has gone up. So the amount that goes to the landfill has come down. And the hazardous waste, like chrome refractory, for example, etc., furnaces are much more longer lasting now. So again, to give a personal example, one needed to rebuild a glass furnace every seven to eight years. And the optimistic scenario may be 10 years. So now there's the concept of so-called infinite life. Of course, there's nothing infinite, but it has gone up dramatically. Through regular maintenance, through <coughs> high temperature refractory, etc. Similarly, the amount of energy that is used, the fraction that comes from renewable has gone up. And I should also mention that when you're talking about reducing footprint, you not only have to look at the footprint of manufacturing itself, but all the supporting that goes of how you run your building, your factory, the energy that is used to maintain the factory the energy that is used in science and technology center for people like myself to do their, whatever they do. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> you have to take a holistic look. There's also been a dramatic increase in the recycle and reuse of effluent water. And 
we have to be the part of community. So remember, for development to be sustainable, it has to be durable for people, for planet, in addition to make economic sense. You have to do that as well. So with that, I think I'll end my talk by making some <clears throat> the prefrontary concluding remarks. We all know that glass is a, one of the most transformative materials known to mankind. It provides an extremely versatile platform for scientists, engineers to exploit, and it's indispensable for modern living. Many of the talks that you heard, I would say almost all of them, brought in sustainability. It is vitally important for sustainable development. The short time that I have, I try to focus on just very narrow sector, but extremely important sector. And there are two products which we take for granted, insulation, windows, automobiles, the dual glass is playing for its applications in those sectors. Over the recent decades, significant progress has been made in reducing the footprint to manufacture glass. More importantly, people are not looking at the climate, environment from a narrow, slip. They're looking at it from a holistic point of view. So not only manufacturing footprint, but also how you operate your business in totality. So last item is basically saying that we need to continue on that path. <coughs> so with that, thank you for your attention.